Running Aces Casino and Racetrack is the Twin Cities' premier choice for exciting entertainment. 24-7 gaming and dining, monthly comedy shows, and $1 blackjack with no commission or ante, making it the most player-friendly casino around. Trout Air Tavern at Running Aces offers Minnesota-inspired handcrafted dishes with locally sourced ingredients and the trout that made the area famous. Running Aces Casino and Racetrack, 25 minutes north of downtown. Visit runaces.com. Running Aces, your night out is waiting. Mackie and Judd are talking twins. Talking twins. Now, with 1500ESPN.com senior web editor and resident seam head Derek Wetmore, presented by the Canopy Group for the best insurance coverage at the absolute best price. Okay, normally I would be against the color analyst screaming, Go Drew, there. Uh, having done play by play, when your color person jumps over you, it's annoying. But in that case, yeah, that's that's justified. If a catcher has a shot at an inside the park home run, you are allowed to openly scream and root for him. Matthew Collar, Courtney Cronin in for Mackie and Judd. Derek Wetmore, our twins reporter, joining us now. Derek, how did this happen? How? How did what <laughs> what, what 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 happened? I'm still in that, shock and awe. That's right. I think they are too. They came into the break feeling pretty good about themselves. I think it was nine and two on the last home stand, and it's like, okay, well it's a lot of ground to make up, but we've got a shot at this thing here. I think that Royal Series pretty effectively took the uh, wind out of the sails, not just the Butera inside the Parker, but that was the nail in the coffin for that three-game sweep, too. And, and they've got nine more coming up on, that are all on the road. Is that right? Yeah, it's a long road trip before yeah. they get home, and, and I don't know if that helps them or hurts them, honestly. They, it might not be the same team by the time they get back to Target Field. Probably not. And when you take a look at this trade deadline that's coming up, obviously they're in seller mode right now. There's been the ups and downs and you know where the identity of this team is this year. I think it's safe to say, Derek, that let, let's just cut, let's just burn it down now. As I think Matt and I talked about this two months ago on the very same time slot. Brian Dozier is that name that we're hearing a lot of interest from the Brewers there. Is there still a mystery team potentially in the mix? I think Doogie reported something on that. But is there is it really the Brewers that are the front runners to potentially, you know, tap into this right before the trade deadline? I would say mystery team is one of the overused words at this time of year, but I will also back that up by saying anybody who is in on Manny Machado and feels like they need that bat, especially from an infielder. They ought to be in on Brian Dozier. Okay, the Dodgers get Machado, so sort of consolation prize, if you want to call it that. Might be Brian Dozier. It might be Eduardo Escobar. I think teams like the Phillies make sense there. You mentioned the Brewers. That makes all kinds of sense, too. Um, But if I'm the Twins, I'm currently trying to decide, do I want to trade Brian Dozier, or do I want to see him play out the rest of his contract here, offer him the qualifying offer, and then if he walks away, you get a nice draft pick for compensation there. I I think that's kind of the decision for the Twins is not, will there be a suitor? For sure there will be a suitor. It's, is the package that we get back from a trader, a trade partner, is that going to be better than the draft pick and the slot money? I I don't know what that answer is, but that's the question I'd be asking myself right now. Derek Wetmar joining us here. Matthew Collar, Courtney Cronin, in for Mackie and Judd. Am I wrong, Derek, to be a little bit annoyed with this team for getting swept in Kansas City? (laughs) Because you know what I was doing? I was talking myself into this, how fun this could be. Even if they traded Dozier, I'm looking at the August schedule, and there's a stretch where they have nine games against only Detroit and Pittsburgh, and then they follow that up with three games against the Chicago White Sox, and Cleveland is mixed in all over the August schedule, so there's your shot at potentially getting back in if they could beat Cleveland. I talked myself into it with, hey, Irvin Santana's coming back, Sano has lost some weight, maybe he'll come back and hit some dingers, maybe Buxton will get healthy, and all of the dreams just flushed with that series, that you should, you should never get swept by one of the worst teams in baseball. Right. You are right to be annoyed. We don't agree all the time, my friend, but in this case, it's exactly right. I I think that the thing that the Royals series reminded me of this season is who they're playing without. The Twins, that is uh, Miguel Sano, Byron Buxton you just mentioned. They're also missing Jason Castro, who I think has been a bigger loss than people recognize behind the plate. Uh, Irvin Santana is going to be making his first start of the season on Wednesday. That that was the ace last year. He's the guy that started the wild card game for you in New York, and you're just getting him back. So to me, it is a reminder of sort of who's not there. I mean, let's be honest, Byron Buxton probably catches that sinking liner 
and Drew Butera does not circle the bases on an inside the park home run. Uh, that's not to denigrate Jake Cave or anything. It's just the Twins are playing with a lot of backups this year. They just got Jorge Polanco back in the lineup. That to me is what it it sort of underscored here. This Royal series, I think. To your point on the schedule, the Indians and the, the Central being weak, and boy, they can really beat up on some teams. I think that's what Twins fans are telling themselves. I think Indians fans are looking at it and saying, oh, we get to beat up on every team in the Central, including the Twins. So I, I think it's just kind of a perspective depending on who you're rooting for. So my question goes back to, my, I think it was probably last week, was it last Sunday that we saw Fernando Rodney in the fifth inning? Never, you haven't yeah. seen him there in about a decade. That's right. Um, what What's going on with these bullpen struggles, and why... Do you think that there's not been as active as an approach to kind of, I mean, this is something we talked about going in from last season to now, how to aid some of these problems with, you know, your guys in the later innings. I mean, what what is the crux of this uh, from the first half? Can you define, like, why they, they, these bullpen woes continue to happen? Yeah, I think I'd look at it from a 30,000-foot view here, which is to say the Twins feel really good, or felt in the past anyways, really good about their young core of relievers, the guys that are in the minor leagues that throw 98 and are trickling up through the system. I think that's the one thing you can really question from this past winter, the way the front office assembled their bullpen by getting Fernando Rodney on sort of a cheap deal. Addison Reed, they might have got a little bit of a discount, and he's had his struggles and injuries might have played a part in that. Um, And then Zach Duke. So they basically said, well, the back end of our bullpen wasn't good enough. Let's go get three guys who are good pitchers, but they're not, you know, Araldis Chapman. They're not Kenley Jansen in his prime. They're not the mow them down kind of guys. It's good, solid, trustworthy relievers. And the backside of that is they haven't really had any of those young guys bubble up. I mean, Ryan Presley's had some impressive outings. Trevor Hildenberger, some ups and some downs. But, I mean, your Alan Buznitz is, your, gosh, up and down that list. Jake Reed, Mason Melitakis was on that list. There's just a long list of relievers that I think the Twins have felt pretty good about for a couple of years, and we're not seeing too much of that. It's mostly a veteran bullpen. Um, I wouldn't be too surprised, Courtney, if Fernando Rodney gets shopped around, if Zach Duke's name gets mentioned in trade talk. Like I said, I, I'm not 100% sure it'll be the same team by the time they get back to target field. So what is our expectation? Now that I think all of us are on the same page, you got to trade everybody away, burn it down, sell as much as you possibly can. As obnoxious as that is to happen mm-hmm. over and over again as this team tries right. to rebuild, I understand frustration of fans who just want to see them be relevant again, but that's the best way to go now that you've dropped this series and you're nine and a half out, well, you're not going to win a wild card spot. What well, what can we expect that how I mean what can we expect them to get as far as players that come back when you're moving a player like right. Dozier and you know potentially different role players who could fit in I mean we just saw that a team traded a relief pitcher for a top five prospect in baseball so teams do get crazy around this time they do but the Brad Hand trade which I assume is what you're talking about yes. the Indians give up uh, their top catching prospect which you never see people do. But the flip side of that is Indians might lose Cody Allen and Andrew Miller to free agency this year. And Brad Hand, who's a great reliever in his own right, is under team control through, I think, 2021. So they're not trading present for the future. They're trading future for the present and future. On your question for Dozier, what could you get? I mean, you could get a prospect, but I don't think Twins fans are going to be wowed by the return for Brian Dozier. And that's simply because teams aren't giving up a lot anymore in terms of their top prospects for quote-unquote rental players. I mean, with two months and some change left on a contract before he hits free agency, there's no guarantees Dozier would stay with whatever team he's playing for next. And the same goes for Manny Machado. You look at Manny Machado, one of the young stars in baseball, and I think the thinking around that prospect package that they got back, that Baltimore got back for trading Machado, was kind of like, eh, all right, they got maybe they got some future major leaguers. There's there's nobody that Orioles fans were jumping up and down saying, "Oh my gosh, we got him!" So the the days of the you know Mark Tashira trade him and restock your whole farm system all at once, I think those have gone by. And uh, you you talked about selling the farm, and I do think it's time to sell. But I would caution the Twins. I think they have to think about 2019. This to me, this is not a rebuild. It's you'd like refinance right now. Refinance your home get a better interest rate and run it back in 2019, you know, with some of the young players 
the Sanos, the Buxton, you get them back, Jose Barrios leading the rotation, I, I think they have a chance to be a pretty good baseball team next year. So I wouldn't make a uh, fire sale. I would just get rid of the guys that don't have any part in next year's team. So tell me, what are the goals then, or what should Twins fans care about for the rest oh. of the way? Well, 1A, Byron Buxton, 1B, Miguel Sano. If those two guys get right, Matthew, it solves a lot of these little problems. Oh, the seventh inning is a little insecure. Okay, that's fine. If you have a player who's one of the top 20 in all of baseball, or if you have two of those guys, it's a lot easier to sort of smooth over some of your rough edges. And then I guess if you're the sentimental type, the Joe Maurer situation is going to be really interesting the rest of the way because he's trailing only Harmon Killebrew in franchise history in terms of getting on base. And I think I think it's 68 more times on base that Maurer has to get, which is achievable for him if he stays in a Twins uniform the rest of the way, stays healthy, and keeps hitting. That, to me, is going to be, is this a retirement tour, or does he come back for a year or two? Is he done playing baseball? We, we don't know because he's so short with the answers. He continues to say, as long as I'm contributing, as long as I'm productive, I'd like to keep playing, and if you'd, be so kind, I'd like to not talk about it anymore. And that's just his personality. To me, that's going to be one of the things that I, I hope Twins fans are following the final two months. All right, Derek. Um, can you tell me the last time a former Twins backup catcher had an inside-the-park home run? Oh, I will have no, to consult I don't, I don't have any idea. Back <laughs> I have no yeah. idea. I just thought that maybe there was a chance that you would give us a Jason Stark moment of your own, and you would know oh, that man. immediately. So you've come I up short. I wish I could... I'm not on that level, but uh, I will get back to you when I come up with that. All right. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, guys. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. TCL launched a new lineup of award-winning 4K Roku TVs to deliver the best sports, movies, TV shows, and thousands of streaming channels. TCL's personalized home screen makes it easy to customize your TCL to fit the way you watch. Binge watch what you want, when you want. TCL delivers excellent picture quality, sleek design, and stunning resolution at an affordable price. TCL, America's fastest-growing TV brand, is available at major retailers everywhere. Learn more at TCLUSA.com. I'm Rita Foley with an AP News Minute. The FBI investigation of Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh may wrap up today, we're told. But Christine Blasey Ford, who accuses him of sexual assault, apparently has not been interviewed. Nor has he. Does that worry key Republican Senator Jeff Flake? Well, we have the statement of Dr. Ford, and then we have uh, hours of testimony. So, uh, frankly, uh, when we talked about an FBI investigation, it was to follow up leads that might corroborate uh, her account. So I'm not troubled by that. Standing next to Senator Flake on Capitol Hill, his friend, Democratic Senator Chris Coons, for whom the speed of the investigation raises questions. Um, That would concern me. Um, I hope the FBI has been allowed to follow uh, all the reasonable leads from the credible allegations that were before the committee last week. Uh, And I know that puts them under a lot of pressure, but they've got the resources to do it. He and Senator Flake were on the Today Show this morning. I'm Rita Foley.